Let's welcome in our co-host, the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Good morning, Rob. Have you ever considered that when you mentioned the guest is going to show this generosity of yes. picking up all these funds, they may reciprocate and not say a word during the whole show? No, I don't, I, up. I don't think they, they might. Do Katie I'm, might be the first one to do that, too. Why would a generous person reciprocate by not talking? Because you uh, taking money out of our pocketbook. No, nonsense. Yeah. No. Well, somebody's got to pay for these things. Yeah, you, I just thought it was going to be Katie. Well, to pay Katie for. will today, but uh, tomorrow another person yeah, will pick up the tab. Yeah, it's, it's a daily occurrence here of generous guests. <laughs> We're generous always grateful guests. for that. <laughs> Let's welcome in our special guest. Uh, that's prosecuting attorney Katie wilkes delegate here in Berkeley County. Katie, good morning to you. Good morning. You're going to need to start putting a disclaimer on when you uh, <laughs> tell your listeners that every first guest you have every day is paying for rate on test kits. Yes, they're free rate on test kits. So, so the, the tab doesn't add up that fast. I'm in on the joke. So, yeah. so it's not too, too much of a burden, but still, it is uh, nice of you. Yeah, but it's a nice way to shine a generosity spotlight on the guest. It is. Yeah. So, yeah. so everybody comes away feeling that, man, that Katie Delegati is such a nice, generous person. And it nets out, too, from the generous guest fee that we pay. Mr. Yeah, Hornby yeah. forks over a check. That check goes straight to the health department to pay for the test kits. Yeah, yeah. Nets out to a zero. So, uh, Katie, you've been busy pretty much of late. <laughs> There's a lot going on in Berkeley County. It has been a very busy uh, couple months and is shaping up to be a very busy next couple months as well. Let's get to a couple of the headline things first, which I know your office is not investigating. There are special investigators that have been assigned to these things. And, and one, of course, is the Elaine Mock trial. Yes. I, I know, obviously, you're not investigating it, but are you aware of where that trial is from a, a process standpoint? My understanding, just from what's publicly available, is that that trial um, was continued. It was supposed to take place at the beginning of the month and was continued, but I don't have the date that it's going to happen now. Okay. And it, 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 when a trial gets continued, is that usually the defense that's uh, responsible for the continuation or the prosecution? It can go either way. It really depends. Um, <clears throat> so that, that trial has been continued a number of times, and I believe it's um, those motions have been made both by the state and the defense. Um, but that's all, <clears throat> excuse me, that's sure. all being handled out of um, Morgan County. So mm -hmm. I just know what's what's publicly available, basically. Okay, and uh, the Sheriff Nate Harmon situation. Yes. Um, I did request a special prosecutor just to, to look into what happened there, and that also was assigned to Morgan County. Okay. Is there a reason? That, and I understand, I remember the process you spelled out. It goes to Charleston. They then assign it to a special prosecutor, generally speaking, in the area, usually a surrounding county or something. That is usually the case. There are times where it will get assigned to a special pro to a prosecuting attorney that is further outside the area, further away geographically. But um, to be frank, the assignment is made in Charleston, and they think that the um, Eastern Panhandle is just light years away from anywhere else. So they they tend to just stick us with each other. Mm -hmm. And in regards to any reason why both of these went to Morgan County, is is that? Does that reflect in any way on Jefferson County? Were they were they already busy with other investigations or? Uh, well, yes, it doesn't reflect any way on them other than um, you know these are two higher profile cases where we requested a special prosecutor, but um, that's something that happens as I don't want to say as a matter of course, but um, there are other reasons why we might need a special prosecutor, like if. Um, the defendant is related to someone who works in the office or something like that. Mm -hmm. After um, Matt Harvey was elected, um, he had previously been a criminal defense attorney, so his office had to request a special prosecutor um, whenever the defendant was somebody that he had previously represented. So we and Morgan County got appointed a lot of those. So it's sort of a back and forth thing. Mm -hmm. These two happen to go to Morgan, but um, Jefferson is also special prosecutor for some things that happened out of Morgan County. And so it's just a kind of a give and take. Is your office currently assigned to do any special investigations in, that are ongoing in Jefferson or Morgan County right now? You know, we do have a couple cases where we're acting as special prosecutor. Um, there's, I know, um, one where an employee of uh, one of the offices um, has a child who got in some trouble, those sorts of things. But they're, you know, like I said, this is something that 
Um, those two incidents were, were more publicized, but it's something that happens as a matter of course where there's a conflict and we'll, you know, we, we all sort of um, are statutorily required to help each other out. And uh, Matt Harvey co-hosts uh, on occasion. In fact, uh, co-hosted yesterday. Do you have any co-hosting advice for Matt, having heard his performance a couple times? <laughs> that's a, that's a tall ask. <laughs> Matt Matt and I get along great. He he does a good job, and we're um, we're fortunate in the Panhandle to I think all three of us prosecuting attorneys get along well and are um, able to you know, help each other out when needed. Who's the Morgan County prosecuting attorney? Dan James. Dan James, okay. I've heard the name a couple of times, I just couldn't recall it at the moment. Uh, let's talk about this recent uh, drug gang bust. That, uh, as, you, as I read uh, the release that was sent out, it had all the makings of a future Netflix uh, series coming up. This said uh, drugs, uh, murder, gang, uh, everything you look for in a situation like that was there. Yeah, it's actually, it's rare that, that we go out of our way to have um, a press conference or something like that. But in this case, um, I wanted to draw attention to um, the work that was put in by law enforcement on this. Um, as as you know, I'm. it's rare that I comment in any way on anything before we have a, a trial verdict. But in this case, um, we were able to present and get a return from the grand jury on a 158 count indictment. Um, and this arose out of shootings that happened um, last February. There were three inside the city limits and one in the county. And at first, you know, there were certainly rumblings about who was responsible, but um, we were not able to actually determine who had um, committed these shootings. And so with detectives from city police and um, investigators from the sheriff's department, they enlisted the help of the um, Eastern Panhandle Drug and Violent Crimes Task Force. And um, they were able to uncover that this was all part of an ongoing criminal enterprise um, known as Get Money by Any Means uh, or GMBAM, and um, were able to further investigate and conduct drug buys. And uh, so it ended up putting together a, a very comprehensive investigation. And that was also with some assistance from our fusion center in Charleston. They assisted with some cell phone analysis. Um, so we're really thankful for their ability to work together. It took 1,700 pressed fentanyl pills off the street. And pressed fentanyl is one of the things I wanted to talk about just to raise awareness about mm -hmm. that because when we first started seeing those, um, it's, it's led to a lot of overdoses because people think that they're oxycodone. They look like that. They're blue um, and they just look like a pressed, you know, a, a, a tablet, a pill. Um, but they are actually pressed fentanyl, which can be deadly. So how long ago did this stuff start showing up on the street in Martinsburg? Um, I would say last last winter to spring. So it's been around for about a, a year probably, but it took some time for us to really be aware of what, you know, what it was and, and what it does to people. Have we had direct overdose deaths as a result of this in Martinsburg? I'm... Uh, I, I don't know the specifics, but I am I'm sure that we have certainly had overdoses because of it. Where will these cases be tried? In Berkeley County. Will your office be heading up all the investigations? For for what the indictment that was returned? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, they all have their arraignments, I believe, on Friday, and um, trial dates will be set then. Do you remember the question, Katie, are you tough enough to do this job? I very much remember that. I are, are you asking if I'm? Are you asking it again? No, I think it's been answered. <laughs> I appreciate that, <laughs> Billy. Uh, uh, Katie, uh, good morning. Uh, a couple of questions. You gave us a teaser uh, when you first sat down. There's going to be a busy next month or so. Can you expand on that? What's coming down the pike? Uh, I in in two weeks I have back to back murder trials. Okay. So and um, we actually just uh, before grand jury, uh, it was two weeks before this past grand jury um, tried a murder case and got a second degree murder conviction. Mm -hmm. um, so I have that one that I I took part in trying with my um, one of my assistant prosecutors Joe Kinzer, and then um, it just the trial schedules just happened to work out that. Uh, Ray Boyce and I have one of my assistant prosecutors and I have 
two murder trials coming up that are scheduled right next to each other. Okay. Uh, are you involved at all with the, the problem the school system's having now with the computers down? Uh, no, not really. Um, I mean, it's certainly something that the whole county is aware of um, because – um, as I think everyone knows, all of your listeners know, Gary Wine is uh, amazing and mm. uh, immediately jumped on making sure that there was no way that could that could pass to um, to Berkeley County. And so there's been some hiccups in terms of emails back and forth from the school system. But um, th- I would say the biggest extent to which I'm involved with the um, issues that the school system is having is um that i hear about it from my little sister who's a geometry teacher <laughs> sure, yeah. okay uh now is investigation and i i don't think i'm speaking out of school because i've not been told officially but everybody assumed to say is the school system the computer's been hacked uh is this a federal issue a state issue it's obviously not a local issue for investigation I would assume that it's a a federal issue because mm-hmm. of um, I, I don't know where the hacks are coming yeah. from. A lot of the times they're they're foreign. So yeah. um, most of the time, when it's something that is uh, certainly you can have a Berkeley County individual hack another Berkeley County individual, and that's you know something that we would address. But um, most of the time, those are federal issues. Yeah, I'm impressed how tight the lid has been placed on this uh even some of the national cases that we've had a hacking job there's more information being released than what we find in berkeley county but i I, there's a there's a reason for that so i'm not going to criticize uh let's go back very quickly to uh uh uh, to elaine malk and also uh uh, sheriff Harmon. uh is there i've been hearing there may be a settlement between uh, elaine malk uh and the and the county and the state have you heard that i have not okay. but again i'm i'm totally out of of yeah, all of that yeah. so mm-hmm. um you know if that does happen i'm sure it'll be filed and mm-hmm. um but but i don't have any personal knowledge of that okay uh and with the um, uh with the sheriff Harmon, i know the investigation has started because i've heard of some folks that have actually been approached and in question do you have a time frame of when the investigation be finished i do not um and that's not specific to that investigation Mm -hmm. that's you know um sort of i I wish that i always had a crystal ball to know how long an investigation would take but it's not really something that i think can be readily predicted and also in all fairness to you as you mentioned a couple so times it's outside of your jurisdiction now this is morgan county so yes. i knew that i was asking the question that you may have heard from from kind of a grapevine uh network as opposed to being directly involved yourself so well it wouldn't be a, a trip yeah. to the station if you yeah. didn't ask some questions i can't answer <laughs> That's so right. yeah let's go back to a question that rob asked you a couple so years ago are you tough enough for this job that was actually not my yeah, question yeah that was not rob <laughs> who, who, who asked that question i never ask anybody okay. with a vowel at the end of their name if they're tough enough to do the job <laughs> even going, if it's i was going to say knowing your father how could anyone ask that question <laughs> <laughs> i hope i hope that means that you think i've inherited my father's toughness I, I, i'd like to you, i'd like to think you, so you, You've inherited a lot of your father and your mother's not only toughness, but intelligence, charm, everything. Let me, well, let me strike the word charm from your dad. <laughs> so. Berkeley County Prosecuting Attorney Kitty Wilkes Delegate is our guest here on the program. And uh, in the governor's state of the state speech, he asked for $250 million to be set aside for basically a new complex for the uh, crime lab uh, in the state and um, other things related to that. When we talked to you a couple of years ago, there was a tremendous backup with trying to get evidence processed and get tests back and such. What's the scenario now, Katie? So we have a really good working relationship with the lab, and they have really worked hard to make sure that we can get the results we we need when we need them. A lot of that has to do with sort of triaging what's sent to them. But like anything else, you know, as as our population grows, we're sending more evidence. It takes time for them to get to things. And it's also hard, I think, to find the um, the analysts that are trained the way they need to be trained to conduct this analysis. And they, they do a lot, not just, you know, drug analysis, but um, the last trial that I had, uh, firearms analysis was a big part of it. So their analyst 
um, went through extensive uh, testing of the murder weapon to make sure it couldn't have malfunctioned and uh, came up and testified about that. So I, I absolutely, you know, I think that they, they do need to be sort of expanded and um, modernized. Um, but they've, like I said, they've worked really hard over the past six years or so to, um, to the extent it's physically possible for them with what they have, um, reduce the backlog that they have. And uh, I think at the time, some folks were using third-party test uh, labs and such. Do we have to do that any longer? We have not used a third-party lab for um, drug or DNA analysis for several years now. So we're, um, we're able to get what we need you know, when, when we need it, for the most part, from our lab. How big is your office uh, now in terms of number of attorneys working for you? Uh, 13 assistant prosecuting attorneys. What was it when you took over? I believe we have added two prosecutors, two? maybe maybe three. Um, I'm thinking that's that's what it was. And with the county continually growing, how do you gauge how many you need? That is also a tough question to ask because, or to answer, in in large part because I believe that our juvenile docket is not as it's, it's very busy. We've had to expand how many prosecutors we have assigned to our juvenile docket, but it's not as busy as it should be because um, DHHR, because CPS does not have the workers that they need to be able to effectively investigate and bring um, allegations to us to file petitions for abuse and neglect. So I think, you know, that's a big topic of conversation now. I know you've had some, you know, guests on to talk about that. Um, if we were appropriately staffed, I think we would find a huge uptick in those cases that would require additional prosecution. But that and pl tied along with the just the busyness we've had recently with, like I said, we're you know we're going to have tried three murder cases uh, by the time we get to April just for 2023. Um, we just returned this enormous indictment. Um, I think we're we're continuing to to grow and sort of stress the the needs of the office. So if and there's a lot of legislation right now in the Capitol with between the, the rearranging of DHHR on uh, Friday morning, we're going to have a delegate on who was uh, the author of a, a bill in regards to foster care in the state and child protective services. If these bills go through and get the proper funding, then you may need to add to your staff. I could foresee that being a possibility. Um, I think that that's going to take some some time because even if they release you know all the funding that we need there's going to be time to attract and train um cps workers to be able to to do their jobs but um i, I do think that it, it could be an addition in some ways it's going to help us because as it is now with uh youth services workers for like juvenile delinquency and juvenile status offenses, um, they're stretched so thin that my office is doing a lot of what they should be doing in terms of making referrals, um, you know, running meetings, things like that. Um, but overall, I would anticipate um, at least temporarily needing to sort of reallocate resources within my office and look at whether we'd need to um, – you know, add a prosecutor. I did ask for an additional prosecutor in my budget request this year, our budget meeting, um, to learn what has been allocated as tomorrow. So we'll we'll see how that goes. But I can't say enough good things about the um, my working relationship with the county council through the time I've I've been in office. They've been very. I, I make a point to never ask for anything other than what I really need, and I think they've they've been very responsive to that. That's an interesting point. And I think uh, with Sheriff Harmon, since he's taken over, we don't see the drama aside of personal issues that are undergoing more, um, right now. But we didn't see the drama under Nate when it came to budget requests that we'd seen under the previous, at least the previous two sheriffs. And I, we never hear drama out of the prosecutor's office when it comes to budget requests. Congratulations, by the way. Thank, thank you. And, and it was not always that, that the case used to have a lot more friction than what they have now. There but was. but you, you've paid uh, credit to the county council. I've heard from most of the county council 
the same thing reciprocal to you, how much they enjoy working with you and how professional you and your office are. So you going to tell us the ones you haven't heard that from? <laughs> most. You didn't say most. <laughs> most. I, I don't, some of them I don't see on a regular basis. So it's the ones that I see on a regular basis all are unanimous, uh, all in agreement there. A couple of things you said. We're talking about uh, Child Protective Service and, uh, and the caseload. We heard from Lane Dale yesterday that the caseload in West Virginia, at least in the Eastern Panel, is five times the norm of what it is in most other states. Uh, are you seeing the same thing, not from your perspective, but from the uh, uh, Child Protective Service? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, I agree with, with that uh, wholeheartedly. They have far too many um, cases to be managing effectively the cases yeah. that they have. Okay. Let me go back uh, to the uh, uh, centralized uh, lab that we have in Charleston. Uh, the the data, the information that you send to them, is that all carried, hand carried to them, or do you use the mail service, uh, uh, or how do you get it down to them? It depends on the type of case. So, um, in in the agency, um, we do utilize uh, mail for a lot of things to be mm -hmm. sent to the the lab, but there are also cases where um, officers will drive evidence down. Yeah. And what's uh, what makes that determination? Really, a lot of it is, like I said, the type of case. So if it's a murder case, the um, the officer or deputy or trooper or whomever will be um, traveling to Charleston to attend an autopsy and they'll take it with them to that. Okay, or if they, um, state police, they have to go back and forth to Charleston fairly frequently. So when someone goes, they'll take a large, you know, kind of whatever evidence needs to go down. But if it's something that um, needs, you know, prompt uh, analysis, it might be overnighted or um, mailed. So it really just depends on the, the situation and the agency. So you've had no problem of something being lost in, in, in transit? No. Now, I know that before I took over, there was an issue with um, somebody working for the Postal Service who was um, stealing drugs that were being mm -hmm. sent to the lab. Mm -hmm. um, that was investigated. I believe that individual was prosecuted. Um, and for some time there, we did not utilize the mail. But um, recently, we've, we've not had any issues with that. Mm -hmm. Katie, you mentioned that you might need another prosecutor. If you were to uh, draw up your wish list of things the prosecuting attorney's office needs besides another uh, prosecutor, what would be on it? If it were a wish list, if I could have any anything in the world I wanted, yes. I'd like more offices with windows because they keep us in the uh, basement and it gets a little uh, <laughs> dreary down a little, there. A little musty. <laughs> but that is not... Uh, not feasible with the infrastructure we have right now. That and um, more more courtrooms. We, we need more courtrooms. Damon Wright on our Facebook comment page, Damon works for ATF, also a member of the school board, mentioned that it might be a good idea to have regional labs so that you didn't have to go all the way to Charleston for something like that. That's not in the governor's plans nor the legislature's plans at the moment, but would something like that make sense? That would be really interesting to have. Um, and so we have a one of the cases I have coming up, the um, suspect was actually apprehended in Pennsylvania. So I've been communicating a lot with their state police um, and the individuals who helped apprehend him and collect evidence. And they have a similar setup. They actually have um, evidence teams locally that will go process a scene. They have their own mini labs they can use to process evidence. And then uh, they have a regional crime lab and then a state crime lab. And um, that is, you know, certainly an, an interesting setup and um, something that I think could be beneficial. Uh, one of the things we run into is um, just for our uh, our witnesses, we have to have them drive up from Charleston. We have to put them up in a hotel. Um, and we also have to compete with 54 other counties who may also have them under subpoena and try to try to work that out. So, you know, something more regionalized could be helpful. Oh, uh, and just sorry to cut you off because yeah. I'm sure we're getting close to time. But sure. in a um, pipe dream, more medical examiners would, would be key because oh. our office of chief medical examiner is very understaffed. Do I have time for one follow on that, Rob? Only if it's a quick one. It's a quick one. Uh, you mentioned uh, more space, and there's some talk about converting the old Crawford building. Where, are, where is the county in on that? Do you know? 
I am not sure. I know that they have a lot of ongoing construction mm -hmm. projects yeah. and are replacing the HVAC in the Judicial mm -hmm. Center. So uh, I think probably not where I'd like them to be, yeah. but I, I can't really speak yeah. as mm -hmm. to their, the timing yeah. for that. Any final thoughts or anything else you need to get across to the community? I just want to um, thank you for the opportunity to share with the community. Um, thank the Sheriff's Department and uh, City Police and Task Force officers for all the work they put into this indictment because it wouldn't have happened without the uh, interagency cooperation that we had. Um, and just remind everybody that um, my door is always open in my office for people who have questions, concerns, or, or anything, really. Oh, and I should ask this question because uh, it's been asked of me to ask you, so I will. Uh, is the situation with the sheriff affecting your work or any law enforcement in Berkeley County in any way? It's certainly not affecting me. I can't answer for, you know, any anything outside my office, but it's not affected our office at all. Very good. Katie, thank you so much. Appreciate you coming in today. Thank you. Berkeley Thanks, County Katie. Prosecuting Attorney Katie Wilkes, Delegate. And uh, note that I said Delegate. It is not Delegati. I will not stand for the mispronunciation of Italian names on this show, by the way. Certain things I won't negotiate, Bill. And he's looking right at me. <laughs>